Mic check, mic. Mic check, mic check. Testing, testing, mic check. One, two, one, two. One, two, one, two. Mic check, check. Check, check. Mic check, check. One, two, one, two. One, two. Mic check, 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 check. Steve Cook. Keep talking. Mic check. Mic check. 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 Mic check. Check. Go Hawks. Check. Check. Mic check. Steve Cook. Charleston, South Carolina. March 7th. Good year of the Lord. 2024. 6th? No. Ah, yesterday, tomorrow. Same difference. Check. 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 Who knows? Check. Check. Everybody good? Copy that. Thanks, thumbs up. Doing one more. Doing one more. Check. Check. Good? Copy. Check, mic check, final check, mic check, 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 everybody good, check, check, mic check, 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 mic check, 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 continuing to talk, rubber baby buggy bumpers, check, check, that's all I got, you're the best. Thanks, Susan. Mic check, one, two. Nikki Haley, presidential campaign, mic check, 212, what is today, March 6th, Wednesday, March 6th, Nikki Haley, presidential campaign, mic check, 212, everybody give me a thumbs up when you got it, yeah, we got some thumbs ups, back risers, everybody, good, 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 mic check. As soon as I see your thumbs, I will step aside. <laughs> All right, I think everybody's got it. Thank you.
30, upwards of 40 percent of Republicans who were still saying at this late time, when it seemed like Donald Trump had it sewn up and, and delivered for him, that they didn't want him to be the nominee. And yes, the skepticism about whether he's even qualified to be president, fit to serve if he's convicted of a crime, that's real. I think I think the, the endorsement itself uh, would, would, would give... Um, I think less oxygen to the anti-Trump movement inside the Republican Party. Um, if put more people in line. I think if, if she holds out on endorsing or doesn't endorse at all, there's going to be more stories about it. There'll be more drama around it. It changes the tone of the tenor of the convention, which I presume she wouldn't attend if she's not uh, endorsing. The flip side of it, and I've talked to people that have been that are very close to Haley, that have raised money for her. They feel like if Haley endorses Trump at any point, she sacrifices all of the uh, all of the goodwill that she has built up over many many months um, as being this the last one standing. And, and this warrior that's warning about the future of the party, and that if she, if her view is that Donald Trump is going to lose to Joe Biden, then um, th then she's a better position to say, "I told you so" after the fact, than to than to try to help him and endorse him when clearly she has been so clear that 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 uh, that he would not be a good idea for the country, uh, not a good idea for the party. So does she stick to those principles? Does she essentially uh, exact some particular demands or get some get some promises out of Trump uh, as a condition of an endorsement or being back in the fold? That's an open question for her, but. Uh, you know, I don't see her uh, doing what uh, Matt Gorman's boss, Tim Scott, did, say, in endorsing and being a, 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 a full-throated supporter. I also don't see her doing what Ron DeSantis did, which was kind of the quiet, quick endorsement, uh, and, then, and then disappear from the national stage. I don't think she's there yet. So, Matt, you've been there having to plan one of these speeches, as it looks like they're starting sound-checking and, and all that, preparing for Nikki Haley's expected uh, withdrawal from the Re Republican presidential race. So, Matt, what are you watching for in this speech? What goes into planning something like this? What does she need to do here? How careful is the wording? I, I think what most people forget are speeches like this aren't about the past. It's not about what just happened. It's about setting a narrative for the future. What role does she want in the party? What does she want to do, not just, you know, six months from now, but a week from now and two weeks from now, and being able to really encapsulate what just happened and lay out the path ahead. I, I think you're right. I wouldn't expect to see a quick endorsement. She's what I expect from her today is really take ownership of what she calls that 40% of voters. It's, you know, kind of a fuzzy number there based off the South Carolina margin that she got, but the 40% of voters who wanted something different. And she will try to be the owner of those votes and the almost the gatekeeper of that and make Trump in his bid to unite the party appeal to, in a way, her voters. And I think if she can kind of stand as the gatekeeper for that, it'll allow her some kind of heft in the weeks to come. Now, look, this is somebody who worked for Trump. Um, so I don't expect her to hold out an endorsement that long, but I think she's going to guard it and in a way work for it a bit. John, what are you hearing from Trump's inner circle in terms of reaction to him becoming the presumed nominee and what this means for the campaign going forward? Well, as far as reaction, I mean, I can tell you multiple sources close to former President Donald Trump are, are jubilant this morning. I've spoken to several, texted with many. Um, this was a day that, look, they felt should have come weeks ago. As one person said to me, we're happy, wish this was, was after New Hampshire because they felt at that point they had locked it up, but nevertheless, happy it finally happened. Look, I, I think I think what they're hoping for today, they're going to be listening to Nikki Haley quite closely as soon as she takes the mic. They want to see what she says. And their big thing is, look, the writing is on the wall. The party is all behind him. You should fall in line, too. And that is something that they're going to be expecting. Now, if there is some sort of a message of you need me, you need me, look, Donald Trump is not happy with Nikki Haley. He has not liked the way that she has attacked him. It's not been too forceful, but nevertheless, far more, as Rick Klein noted, than any other of his previous challengers in this primary contest. So that is what they're going to be watching for. And if she does want something, look, this is a person who previously attacked Donald Trump and was one of the few of his opponents in 2016 to join the Trump cabinet when he was in the White House. So I think a lot remains to be seen. But I do think the one thing that I hear from Donald Trump's team repeatedly this morning, different words, but basically the one that I've heard repeatedly, let's go. They are targeted, ready, and aiming for Joe Biden this morning, right. Diane. So let's talk about maybe the larger impact there. ABC's Jay O'Brien is in Washington for us. And Jay, former President Trump has already pressured Republicans in Congress to kill the bipartisan border bill. So how do you expect him to exert his influence on Washington 
in other areas ahead of the election in November. What are you hearing from lawmakers there? Well, well, I think it all comes down to that data point that John just gave, which is this notion of how quickly does Nikki Haley, as the Trump campaign would put it, quote unquote, fall in line. Other than Nikki Haley and a few notable other prominent Republicans, Mitch McConnell is chief among them, although Rachel has some reporting out this morning that the McConnell team and the Trump team are in talks about an endorsement. There haven't been many Republican holdouts in in terms of endorsing Donald Trump. Chris Christie is one, obviously, he has a history of criticizing Trump over what he says is a threat to democracy. Um, but I'll give you one point that is kind of instructive to this whole theme, which is we had a guy named Tom Emmer on our show for our election coverage uh, last night on ABC News Live. He's the number three Republican in the House of Representatives. Tom Emmer's bid to become the next Speaker of the House was tanked by Donald Trump. It was Donald Trump who killed him from ascending to that job. And nonetheless, Tom Emmer, not to mention every other member of House Republican leadership, has fallen in line and endorsed Donald Trump. And we're seeing that across the spectrum with prominent Republicans. We're also seeing that in Trump's planting of his flag on the RNC and the ousting of Ronna McDaniel and Trump's takeover, really, of that organization. And so he's remaking the party in his image. And so the question facing Nikki Haley is, how long does she hold out and does she even hold out from giving Trump that endorsement. The other question now facing the Trump campaign, we talked about what faces Nikki Haley, is what kind of outreach, if at all, as Terry pointed out earlier, do they do to those Nikki Haley voters, particularly suburban women? I've talked to Democratic strategists both last night and this morning who are really banking on the fact that Trump does not do that outreach to them, does not try to build a bridge to those moderates. They say he doesn't have it in him. The question facing Trump is, does he? And for those just joining us at any moment now, we are expecting to hear Nikki Haley announce that she is dropping out of the race for the White House. We have a live look there at the podium in Charleston, South Carolina, where she's expected to make that announcement again within just a few minutes. I want to go to Galen Druk as we wait for that announcement. Galen, exit poll shows 79% of Nikki Haley voters say they would be dissatisfied with Trump as a nominee. How significant is that? And could that spell trouble for Trump in the general election? It suggests that there's a sincere divide in the Republican Party. And while, of course, the majority is very squarely on Trump's side of that divide, Trump did not win in 2020. And so he doesn't just need to reassemble his coalition from the last election, he needs to grow it. And the challenge here is that Donald Trump's differences from Nikki Haley, as we've discussed here, the axis on which these politics are playing out is not so much about policy. If you look at how Nikki Haley campaigned, she was hawkish on the border. Um, she talked about... And Nikki Haley is going to the podium now. Here's Whit Johnson. This is an ABC News special report. Good morning, I'm with Johnson in New York, and we're coming on the air in the wake of Super Tuesday because ABC News has learned Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley is dropping out of the race. Began, She's speaking right now. The Let's listen. was grounded in my love for our country. Just last week, my mother, a first-generation immigrant, got to vote for her daughter for president. Only in America. I am filled with the gratitude for the outpouring of support we've received from all across our great country. But the time has now come to suspend my campaign. I said I wanted Americans to have their voices heard. I have done that. I have no regrets. And although I will no longer be a candidate, I will not stop using my voice for the things I believe in. Our national debt will eventually crush our economy. A smaller federal government is not only necessary for our freedom, it is necessary for our survival. The road to socialism is the road to ruin for America. Our Congress is dysfunctional and only getting worse. It is filled with followers, not leaders. Term limits for Washington politicians are needed now more than ever. Our world is on fire because of America's retreat. Standing by our allies in Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan is a moral imperative. But it's also more than that. If we retreat further, there will be more war, not less. 
As important, while we stand strong for the cause of freedom, we must bind together as Americans. We must turn away from the darkness of hatred and division. I will continue to promote all those values, as is the right of every American. I sought the honor of being your president. But in our great country, being a private citizen is privilege enough in itself. And that's a privilege I very much look forward to enjoying. In all likelihood, Donald Trump will be the Republican nominee when our party convention meets in July. I congratulate him and wish him well. I wish anyone well who would be America's president. Our country is too precious to let our differences divide us. I have always been a conservative Republican and always supported the Republican nominee. But on this question, as she did on so many others, Margaret Thatcher provided some good advice when she said, quote, never just follow the crowd, always make up your own mind. It is now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those in our party and beyond it who did not support him. And I hope he does that. At its best, politics is about bringing people into your cause, not turning them away. And our conservative cause badly needs more people. This is now his time for choosing. I end my campaign with the same words I began it from the book of Joshua. I direct them to all Americans, but especially to so many of the women and girls out there who put their faith in our campaign. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for God will be with you wherever you go. In this campaign, I have seen our country's greatness from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, America. God bless you. Nikki Haley, the former governor of South Carolina, former UN ambassador right there announcing that she is suspending her campaign and dropping out of the race. She stopped short of endorsing the former president, Donald Trump, and instead saying she congratulates him, wishes him well. She said, we must bind together as Americans, turn away from hatred and division. She also noted it is now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those who did not support him. This is now his time for shooting. Of course, all of this comes after Donald Trump's significant win on Super Tuesday, winning 14 of 15 states in last night's voting. You can see the map right there. Haley had vowed to stay in the race through at least last night, despite pressure from within her own party to bow out. Now, let's go to Eva Pilgrim, who was in Charleston, South Carolina last night. She's back in New York this morning. And Eva, we noted last night that you were not at a campaign rally. You were out on the street. That's because Nikki Haley did not hold an event. Uh, likely, she also, as you noted, uh, was an accountant. She could see the numbers, she could see the math, and it was not in her favor. Yeah, so unusual for a candidate not to hold a campaign event on an election night. And just as you said, which she is good at math. She's an accountant. She said she was going to look at the numbers when she was no longer competitive. She told us just a couple weeks ago that that is when she would get out of the race, and that is what we have seen her do here. It, you know, she stood firm to her promise to stay in until Super Tuesday because she really wanted to give Republican voters a chance to vote for an alternative to Donald Trump. She kept telling us that she was hearing from people that they didn't want to vote for the former president. She was, and she did, get a significant chunk of Republican voters to vote for her, but it was clearly not enough to overtake Donald Trump. And, and I think we have to look today at those Haley voters, who they are. Which I can tell you I've spoken with so many of them. And many of them have voted for Donald Trump in the past. Repeatedly, they told us in the last several weeks and months that they just couldn't see themselves voting for Donald Trump again. And if Nikki Haley wasn't in the race, they didn't know where they would go, who they would vote for. And that's the real question now. Where do those voters go? Will Donald Trump be able to court them to vote for him? Or will they vote for Joe Biden or a third option? Will they just not vote at all? We talked to so many disengaged, disenfranchised voters who just aren't sure that their vote even says anything anymore. Wit, 
there's a lot to be done before November. Absolutely. Eva Pilgrim for us pointing out those questions in the exit polling, also suggesting that within the Republican Party, a small percentage, but not an insignificant percentage, still questioning what to do and who to support going forward. So let's go ahead and bring in ABC's Rachel Scott in West Palm Beach. Rachel, you've been talking to the Trump campaign and the former president calling for Nikki Haley's supporters and the rest of the GOP to unite behind him heading into the general election. The former president just yes, arrived and we were told here. the former president just arrived here at his golf club just moments ago. We are told that he is watching these remarks. The day started with the Trump campaign calling on the party to unify around the former president, calling for Haley to back Donald Trump. Clearly, the former president is unhappy and frustrated that that is not happening. Just moments ago, he posted on a social media account saying that Nikki Haley got trounced last night in record-setting fashion. He says that he's further inviting all Haley supporters to join his movement. There are some clear warning signs here, though, for Donald Trump as he looks at these exit polls and sees that many Nikki Haley supporters say they will not commit to supporting Donald Trump in November. Many of them say they will not even commit to supporting him, especially if he is convicted of a crime. We know the former president is facing 91 criminal charges, still pushing ahead here with this race and this likely uh, matchup with President Biden in November. But this is a remarkable turn for the former president who left Washington, uh, really rebuked by a lot of Republicans for his actions on January 6th, now facing multiple criminal indictments, and now the presumptive Republican nominee. Wh Rachel, Rachel Scott Forrest, thank you. Let's come back into the studio now because with me we have our uh, chief Washington correspondent, John Carl, chief White House correspondent, Mary Bruce. Uh, and Mary, you're following the, the Biden campaign. This is the race that they always wanted. This is the race that they expected. Now they're likely going to get it. Uh, and they believe that perhaps some of these Nikki Haley supporters are up for grabs. They do it. In fact, the Biden campaign feels very strongly. They are confident that there is a significant share of voters out there, Republican voters, who simply are not sold on Donald Trump. They feel that he is not going to be able to expand significantly beyond Trump's really devoted base. In a memo this morning, the campaign saying Trump's path is, quote, limited and his coalition is hemorrhaging. And I have to tell you, I was in Michigan last week for the primary there. We talked to one of these voters, a woman who said, she went in and voted for Haley, but when it came down to it, if this is, was going to be a rematch, she simply couldn't stomach voting for Donald Trump. She was going to vote for Joe Biden despite her concerns about his age, despite the fact that she wished someone else was really running. So you are now going to see the president trying to reach out, trying to court and make his case to Haley's voters. He's going to have a big chance to do that tomorrow night at the State of the Union address. The campaign really views this as the kickoff to the general election this moment. Hey, you mentioned the State of the Union. What, what more are we learning about the president? President's preparation and some of the messages we could hear. He has been deeply involved in preparation over the last few days. We're not going to see him publicly until tomorrow night. This is a huge pivotal moment for him. It's the biggest audience he's likely to have before uh, the conventions this summer. He has to lay out not only his accomplishments, what another term would look like, but he also simply put, has to bring it. He has to deliver a strong, rousing speech with. And John, uh, we heard there from, um, from Eva Pilgrim talking about this question about where Nikki Haley's supporters go from here. Nikki Haley asking Donald Trump to actually try to win them over, try to earn their support. What are we likely to see from Trump and his response to all this? And do you think an endorsement could be possible down the road? Uh, there's going to be a lot of speculation about whether or not Haley will endorse. Trump will be obsessed with this question in the days and weeks ahead, uh, demanding and becoming angry if the endorsement does not come. I don't think Nikki Haley's endorsement will mean much of anything at all, uh, because Nikki Haley went state after state, getting in the early primary states 40 percent of the vote. Now, uh, in yesterday's Super Tuesday uh, states, about 22 percent, if you add them all, all together. Those were not people that were voting because they loved Nikki Haley and were going to follow Nikki Haley to wherever they were going to go. They were voting to register a protest against Donald Trump. And that's why you saw in the exit polls, not just last night, but in the, in the earlier states, uh, Nikki Haley voters saying that they are not, overwhelmingly majority of them, saying they are not inclined to vote for Donald Trump. So the big challenge here is how does Trump get those voters? I thought it was interesting to hear Nikki Haley say that we need to turn away from hatred and division. Hatred and division are at the center of Donald Trump's campaign. Uh, hatred towards those who he thinks have wronged him uh, and, 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 and America and uh, a, a very uh, divisive message. Uh, I don't think Donald Trump is going to be out there actively courting these voters in a meaningful way. And, and you, you talk, oh, forgive me right now, I understand that we are getting a statement from the Biden campaign. Once we get 
that up, then we'll come back to that. But I'm going to follow up with you, John, real quick uh, with, a, with another question, because you were talking about uh, some of the exit polling as well that reflected some of the major concerns going forward for former President Donald Trump. Um, how do they go ahead and address those issues going forward? You have this, I mean, again, it's not a huge portion of the Republican Party, but it's enough to make a significant difference oh, in a general oh. election, especially when we talk about independents and moderates. Look, look in, in a close race, this could be absolutely divisive. And, and let's, let's say the obvious, in general election polls that we're seeing, you know, Trump has a narrow lead over uh, Joe Biden right now. It's very early, but when you get down to the actual voting, he's going to need the overwhelming majority of Republicans to vote for him. It's going to be a very close, very hard-fought election. And if you look at uh, the exit polling, these were like, you know, again, she had a, a clear, she lost. <laughs> she had a clear minority, but it's a significant minority. And not just on the question of will you support Donald Trump, but on a number of, of major defining issues, these are two different parties. Uh, Nikki Haley voters believe that the election wasn't stolen. Donald Trump's uh, voters absolutely think it was. They have vastly different views on things like abortion and immigration and the economy. Um, this is not like a turn the light switch and they're suddenly going to go to Donald Trump. And Mary, let's come to you. I understand that statement just came through from it the Biden just campaign. Hit our inboxes here. The president commends Nikki Haley for having the courage to run and then, as expected, makes a direct appeal to her supporters, saying Donald Trump made it clear he doesn't want Nikki Haley's Haley supporters. I want to be clear there is a place for them in my campaign. He says he knows they won't agree on everything, but on the fundamental issues of preserving American democracy, that he believes they can find some common ground. And Mary, while I have you here, just to follow up on that. Uh, the Biden campaign has been saying from the beginning this was going to be a rematch. Polling suggests that many Americans did not want to see this rematch. And actually, recently, in, in recent days, the polls have even shifted in Trump's favor in a head-to-head -head matchup. Uh, how is the Biden campaign addressing that and, and looking at that trend? Yeah, look, they know this is going to be a very hard-fought campaign, uh, harder and probably tighter than they had hoped and had expected. But they view this as a moment to really crystallize for voters the real stark differences between these two. I think in talking with the Biden campaign, they feel it hasn't fully registered for voters yet that we are, in fact, headed for this historic rematch. They are well aware that voters dislike both of them. They wish this wasn't the moment we are in. They know that the challenge ahead is not just going to be in making clear the stark choice here, but also in encouraging voters simply to get out and vote. This is going to be a race largely about momentum and support and enthusiasm. They also see collective amnesia as a yeah. problem, is the way they see it, that people have forgotten what it was like, especially in Donald Trump's last year in office, that people have forgotten the way his term has ended, and they haven't paid enough attention to what he would actually do if he got elected again. So this is the beginning of a very long general election campaign. I would not put too much stock into polls right now saying how voters are going to vote in November. Yeah, just about eight months to go. John yeah. Carl, Mary Bruce, our thanks to Rachel Scott and Eva Pilgrim as well. We're going to return you to regular programming now. And for some, that is Good Morning America. Of course, our coverage continues on ABC News Live, abcnews.com. David Muir will have a full wrap-up tonight on World News Tonight. For now, I'm Whit Johnson in New York. Have a great day. Thank you, Witt, and you're watching ABC News Live's continuing coverage after former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley dropped out of the race for the White House just now. Haley says she has no regrets and is filled with gratitude for the support she's received. But she warned the road to socialism is the road to ruin for America and called on Congress to stand by our allies in Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan, saying America needs to stand strong for the cause of freedom and turn away hatred from hatred and division. I want to bring in our powerhouse political team with more, starting with ABC News senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott, who's there in Mar-a-Lago. Rachel, how's Trump responding to this announcement from Nikki Haley? Well, Diane, you may remember the day started with the Trump campaign telling me that this is welcome news and that they wanted to see Nikki Haley come around and rally behind the former president and endorse him. Well, the former president just arrived here at his golf club, and as Nikki Haley took the stage, he posted on his social media platform, and he attacked her, saying that she got trounced on Super Tuesday. He then put out this call saying that he welcomes any of Nikki Haley's supporters to come in and behind his movement. The problem here for Donald Trump is, look, 
He has gone after Nikki Haley relentlessly. He's even attacked her husband, who's uh, serving a deployment overseas uh, for, for the U.S. National Guard. Uh, look, he's also called out moderates, saying that they had no place uh, in the Republican Party, pushing to get moderates like Senator Mitt Romney out of the party. And then you see these exit polls that come in that show that Nikki Haley's supporters are not committing to supporting the former president and especially not committing to supporting him if he is convicted of a crime. So, look, the bottom line here is no endorsement from Nikki Haley today. She made that very clear. She also made it clear that Donald Trump has a lot of work to do to earn the support of her voters. That is not a given here. And that is what Donald Trump and his campaign will have to focus on in the lead up to this rematch with President Biden in November. And ABC's Alex Perche is there in Charleston where Haley just made that announcement. Alex, what are you hearing from Haley's supporters? Where could their votes go? Oh, it looks like we don't have Alex. We will try to get him back. But I want to go to our senior national correspondent, Terry Moran. Terry, we heard Haley saying that she will not stop using her voice on issues that are important to her. And she spoke about the national debt. She talked about the need for small government. She called Congress dysfunctional, saying we need term limits. She said the world is on fire because the U.S. is retreating from its allies. What stood out to you from these remarks? That none of those are the positions of Donald Trump. Uh, look, that you could almost feel the earthquake of anger emanating from Florida as she was speaking. This was as far from an endorsement as you could get. Now, maybe she finds some way during the campaign to say, well, now Donald Trump is on my side, because she ticked it off, as you said, on debt. She said, debt is crushing our economy. Donald Trump, as president, exploded uh, the national deficit even before COVID and had no uh, intention of paying for a dime of the tax cut that, that he passed. Uh, Congress is dysfunctional, in part because it's so performative. Trumpism is, is a performance almost more than it is policy. It's about kind of a pugnacious attitude towards anyone who disagrees with you. Uh, she said the world is on fire and said we must stand by traditional allies. Donald Trump doesn't want to do that. He wants to, he, he wants to hold traditional allies accountable in ways that they hadn't been before. He doesn't seem particularly interested in alliances. And he, she, she said it must, it's a time for an end to darkness and division. Darkness and division is, is Trump's calling card in some ways. So she's a long way. She also said that she wished him well, but that she wished anyone who would be our president well. That is not an endorsement. So I, I think what I took away from it is that right now she is a long way from endorsing Donald Trump, and that, could, that definitely will be a problem. She may be biding her time, hoping that some court somewhere manages to convict Donald Trump and that voters follow through on what they're apparently telling pollsters, that that would be disqualif disqualifying. But I, I think it's a bad idea for Democrats or anyone who doesn't uh, support Donald Trump to hope and wish and pray that somewhere a jury will convict Donald Trump. The American people, you know, want to choose their presidents. They don't want juries and courts to do it. And I want to bring in our editor executive editorial producer, John Santucci, on one of the points you made there, Terry. Mm. John, she could have just said, I wish him well. She added in, and these speeches are planned very carefully. She added yeah. in, I would wish anyone well who's going to be president. She pointed out things like politics is about bringing people in, not turning people away. What did you make from that and her just outright saying it's up to Trump now to earn the votes from the party from people who don't support him right now? Well, I think Nikki Haley is making a calculation, Diane, that does she want something from Donald Trump? Look, part of the thing that we know endorsements have ripple effects, right? If you give me your endorsement, I'll give you something in return. Uh, look at uh, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton as an example, right? They were obviously two fierce rivals, went to the bitter end. That was in June of that election year. Not March, so it definitely went much further than what we're seeing in 2024. Um, but in the end, Barack Obama gave Hillary Clinton Secretary of State. That was a huge job, something that Hillary Clinton wanted. So does that something that plays into Nikki Haley's calculus? Look, I can be valuable. I can give you some support. I want something in return. So you got to come and work for it. Now, the statement that Trump issued on his social media platform sort of draws a line in the stand, right? If Haley's saying, I want something, if you're reading through those words, Trump's statement is, huh, I don't really care. I mean, using the word trounced is not a way to bring somebody to a bar for a drink at the end of the day. And that is something that I think just really plays into what we've been hearing inside Donald Trump's orbit for the last several weeks. He's been quite angry at Nikki Haley. He and his top advisors thought she should have gotten out 
early on, gotten out after New Hampshire, gotten out, out after South Carolina, but she didn't. She held on, dragged this out, forced Team Trump to spend money in some cases, not as much as they normally spend because most of the directive of the campaign cash is heading to the courtroom. Donald Trump's legal fees are really taking up the bulk of where he is spending the money that's coming from small donors around this country. So how does this all shake out in the coming weeks? Look, as our teams reported, it looks like uh, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell is edging closer to an endorsement of Donald Trump. That is another key Republican, a moderate key Republican falling in line. And our sources are now telling us, um, I'm hearing in my ear, that we've confirmed that endorsement. That is another big one. That is another huge Republican falling in line here, Diane. So is that something now Nikki Haley looks around and says, wait, am I the only person left? Has everybody else endorsed Donald Trump? And ultimately forces her hand. Maybe that endorsement comes sooner than anybody thought. And let's go to Jay O'Brien on that point there in D.C. Jay, we have already seen former President Trump exert some influence on Washington and, and how policies are passed. So what do you expect now that he has the endorsement of the Senate Minority Leader? Well, uh, let's just start with what Mitch McConnell said, because while there had been reporting out that this was something that the McConnell team and the Trump team, as Jonathan Carl and our Rachel Scott reported, uh, were in talks for for months, this is pretty significant. It's still a bombshell dropping because Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump had that very public break after McConnell said that Joe Biden was the legitimate president. And then certainly after the January 6th attack on the Capitol, where Mitch McConnell gave this speech where he excoriated Trump on the Senate floor and said that he was directly responsible for the Capitol attack. He didn't vote to impeach Trump in that second impeachment trial, but he blasted him in that speech on the floor. So these are Mitch McConnell's words in a statement that our Jonathan Carl has just put out. Quote, it is abundantly clear that former President Trump has earned the requisite support of Republican voters to be our nominee for President of the United States. He goes on to say this, and it, this is interesting, it should come as no surprise surprised that our nominee, he will have our support. During his presidency, we work together to accomplish great things for the American people. That is a pretty full-throated endorsement from Mitch McConnell, who has made no secret in the last few months that he is no fan of Donald Trump's. All right, and we have a lot more on this coming up after the break. Rachel, Terry, John, Rick, thank you all. The news never stops. Again, stay with us. We will be right back. Thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Tomorrow morning on... Good Morning America. Garth Brooks has something super special to share. This is just too, too cool. I cannot wait to show you. And he's sharing it with Robin and you. Robin Roberts, me, and GMA. I'm so excited. Let's do this. Tomorrow morning... Wait till you see this. Only on GMA. I love me some Good Morning America, and I promise you are going to love this. Good Morning America, live from Nashville tomorrow morning. Tonight, the state of play after Super Tuesday. What the rest of the country thinks and how they voted. Plus, the ceasefire talks and getting more aid into Gaza. More Americans turn to World News Tonight with David Muir, the most watched newscast on television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the daily news.